illness and you experience uh, physical abuse in a romantic relationship. You've had conflicts from multiple things that have happened to you over time. And so there's a lot more processing that happens because there's a lot more events to process. And then I think some of the messages that we start to internalize about ourselves when we experience complex trauma, right? With acute trauma, I don't know. I'm Definitely there are um, like some negative messages that you can believe about yourself. But I think when things happen over time, you develop definitely more of a narrative of like, you know, I'm bad or I caused it or it's my fault. And there are these like negative core beliefs that we really develop about ourselves. And so I think there's a lot more processing that has to happen and unraveling that has to happen to really get to the root of like, no, you're not a bad person. You didn't do a bad thing. Something happened to you and you've internalized that. So how can we create a new narrative? How can you create, you know, a more positive cognition about yourself, a positive thought about yourself? And that's kind of what, when we talk about EMDR, which stands for um, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, that's part of what that therapy is. It's finding what is that negative core belief that you believe about yourself while processing a lot of the memories and the images and the body sensations that you have. And once we process that and kind of desensitize ourselves to that, what is, what would you like to believe about yourself instead of I am bad or I am shameful or it was my fault or I'm powerless. What would you prefer to believe about yourself and really instilling a more positive cognition? Do you follow ways with that? Sorry. Yeah. Do do you follow Brene Brown? Oh yeah, I love Brene Brown. Yeah, that sounds I'm, a lot similar to what to what she says. Stuff, you know, it's not you are you are not a bad person. You had a bad thing happen. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. a huge reframe yeah. there. Yeah. So for people. So you, I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up. You are a black woman, and you work in a, a you know highly diverse community there in in Georgia. How much of trauma is due to cultural? Um, experiences that are, you know, longstanding. I mean, we can say racism, but I, I, I hate using racism because it's so overused these days. And I think that the definition's almost been lost, but we can certainly discuss that too. And what your experience has been and how many of your clients may present with that too. And what we may, I'm asking a lot of questions right now. One of those things that they tell you not to do in grad schools, don't ask multiple questions. Cause it's like, which one should I answer? But um, <laughs> broadly, broadly, maybe address that. So for not only the listening audience, but also we have clinicians in our listening audience too. What can we take away from your perspective and your experience? Yeah. um, Knowing that you're not speaking on behalf of the entire black community. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. And I think, you know, I might even push back on the comment you made a little bit about, you know, race. I think racism is a huge part of the, the trauma that, Black people have experienced. Um, and I know it can feel like it's overused a lot. And I think as a person of the community and that has experienced it a lot, um, I, I wouldn't say that it's overused. Um, I would say that it's a real lived experience that we experience sometimes on a daily basis. I Just a personal example, but like a, a microaggression that happened to me two weeks ago, I was presenting at a parent talk at a school and I was the first one to log on to the Zoom call, and it was just the PTA president that was on. And she assumed that I was a parent that was on. And so she was like, oh, what grade is your kid in, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, no. I said, I don't have a child at the school. I said, I am um, here to present tonight. And she was like, oh, you're the presenter? And that was literally her tone and her facial. Well, you guys can't see my facial expression. But I said, yes, I'm the presenter. She was like, oh, okay. And I'm like, but for me, like that happens a lot. That happens all the time. Um, so let me, let me interrupt real quick. People may yeah. not know that term. What's, what is a microaggression and how is that an example of one? Yeah. I don't know if I have the actual definition, but a, 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 a microaggression is something that is kind of a, a small statement or phrase or gesture that most people would think is not harmful, but it, it speaks to invalidate people of color. It, I hope that's a good definition. And, that might be. I'm, I don't work in DNI work, so yeah. you no, that, put me out there. I think that makes a lot of sense. It's perfect. So explain how that one uh, was, was offensive. Cause I think I know, but I'd like you to tell yeah. me. Yeah. Um, well, number one, that, that you assume that I was a parent 
Um, and when I said, no, I'm the presenter, it was the shock and the surprise. Right. That, oh, you're the presenter. Um, it, it just, it's, it's really hard to explain when you're on the other side of it, you know? Um, and when it, you like, you have an emotional attachment to it. Cause I feel like that's happened to me quite a few times. I've shown up in spaces, white spaces where I was the, the presenter that are viewed as the expert in the room and then it was like oh you you are oh and then you kind of get the questions of like oh what school did you go to and it's like this kind of in i say interrogation process it's probably more like you know finding out being more inquisitive about you but yeah that was definitely a microaggression that i experienced uh, recently and i think those things happen more than not um on many different levels and i'm there's plenty of examples you know we can give i, I think i experienced it i told you i worked in a high-end retail store and i experienced experience that a lot at the store um, as an employee where people would not want me to assist them. White people would not want me to assist them, but they would want to go to one of my white counterparts to assist them. Really? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I have stories for days. That's probably a whole other podcast we could do, but yeah, there's, there's plenty of stories and um, instances. So I think that the lived experience of Black people is um one that that has endured a lot of racism and i think a lot of people think that racism is something of the past or that exists or doesn't happen as much as we think it does but i know from personal experience that it can happen on a daily basis so help me help me understand this differently because my my definition of racism is is like an intent right an intent to harm um Mm -hmm. but it's sounding more like and this is why i said i thought it was overused or misused it's sounding mm-hmm. more like racism can be that, but also an unconscious uh, tr- trampling, uh, tr- oh, trampling yeah. that's not a word, uh, trampling <laughs> of somebody's autonomy or their, yeah. or their legitimacy. So it can yes. be un- we can have unconscious exhibitions mm-hmm. of racism too then. Yeah, most of the time that I have, it's usually unconscious. It's usually not intentional, like a direct threat of hurt or something that's, you know, overt. Um, It's usually been that, you know, unconscious, unintentional bias that shows up. Um, And I think there's this amazing, um, you heard of the the Harvard implicit bias, like assessment? Yes. It's a free assessment online. And, you know, I, I actually, I think everybody should take it, not just, you know, people that are not of color. I think all people, because I think we all have bias, right? I have bias. I have um, things that I think of people groups, including my own people group that I have, you know, certain assumptions of. And I think we should all kind of explore and check that and figure out like, where are the areas that I should be aware of um, and areas of growth for myself. That's something that I'm consciously trying to work on too. Um, So yeah, that's just a little plug there for all that one to kind of grow a little bit more aware. And I think it's so important important, especially for clinicians, um, clinicians that do work with people of color to be aware of those biases and find out, you know, where are some of yours um, and kind of explore that. And doing your own work is going to be so important because, of course, nobody as a therapist, we're here to help. We're not here to do um, harm. Um, But sometimes unintentionally, it can be done. When we're talking about... um how to fight this. Uh, I've, I've taken the position that humility is usually a good thing, right? So we don't go in making broad assumptions. And yet, paradoxically, through school, and I don't know if this has changed in the last 10 or 11 years, but paradoxically through school, we get these, you know, multicultural training classes, which are all of one semester and don't do a deep dive mm-hmm. into anything. But then we're supposed to come out being like, trained. Yeah. <laughs> and right. and uh, yeah. as if, as if, right, you can know everything about somebody's culture. And that though is the presumption. It's like, well, you can make these certain generalizations in these certain areas. And the whole time I'm sitting there cringing, gritting my teeth. I'm like, no, that's a terrible idea. Like what we should be doing is out of humility, asking people what their experiences are individually. And I, and I got so much blowback for that because it was like, you're not honoring, you know, the, the, the culture and stuff. And I'm like, no, actually I think I'm honoring it deeper, but maybe I'm off. (laughs) I don't know. Like, is is that the way that we examine our blind spots and try to not be so harmful, whether intentional or unintentional, is just simply through humility? Or is that too oversimplified? 
No, I think, no, I think, yeah, I think we overcomplicate it sometimes and that you're absolutely right. No, you are spot on through humility, uh, through expressing that curiosity um, and through intimate conversations with individuals because no two people from the same people group are going to have the same experiences or think the same way. So yeah, I, I think that is the way that we should approach it. Getting curious about everyone's individual experiences. Now, my husband's a black man as well, um, but he has not had as many experiences that I have had, um, which is interesting. So for him, he probably would say, yeah, he experienced, and this is interesting, as a black man, he would say that he experiences black uh, racism a little bit less than I do, um, but I work in more white spaces than he does. So that might be give or take there. But yeah, everyone has their own history, their own biography. And so I think we do need to get curious and um, not just assume something about a group because you had that one multicultural class way back in college. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I appreciate that. I mean, one of the things that, you know, humble brag for something else we do, which is this guns and mental health stuff is, you know, we're trying to teach firearms culture to clinicians so that they, the firearms owners don't get skittish and weird about coming into mm-hmm. counseling Um, because we're losing a lot of them to suicide because they don't get Mm -hmm. into counseling and then they take their own lives. And a lot of that is just this judginess that happens around that realm. And yeah, there, it's great to have a crash course in something, but if you really want to get into it, you, you got to live the culture. You got to, you got to go take some time and then, and you never, there's no arrival point, right? If you ever arrive, that's when you know you're sunk. (laughs) You're like, Oh, I know everything there is to know about fill in the blank. Um, yes. I hope not because then you would be God. Um, <laughs> there was a, I had a, I had a guest on a few weeks ago. Her name's Jessica Harris, also a black lady. And she, a clinician who said that she doesn't believe that clinicians, how did she phrase this? Clinicians who consider themselves trauma informed aren't truly trauma informed unless they understand the trauma of racism throughout a culture. And I was like, that's cr- like you can't see me blowing my mind with my fingers, but that's the sound I just made. Um, mind, yeah, yeah, that's good. Is is that your experience too? Like, you, there's there's a lot of generational trauma through race, interracial um, judgment and stigma. Absolutely, yeah. I do some talks at um, some different schools, and I, I kind of talk. Oh, yeah, I didn't say that earlier, but I. I help schools, principals, teachers, educators understand the impact of trauma and how it shows up in the classroom, right? But then there's also this other piece that I say that we can't talk about trauma, like she says, unless we're talking about race and racism and understanding how that impacts not just our kids, but the families that are walking through the doors and maybe some stigma that they have with schools or with administration, maybe some historical trauma that they've had themselves. Um, and, you know, just when we look at the U.S. and the, the history that we've had with um, desegregating schools and um, things of that nature, there is a lot of historical trauma that is just in our blood and in our genes. There's an amazing book. Um, I wish I had it sitting next to me, but it's called My Grandmother's Hand, and I do not want to butcher the author's name, but I think it's Resma. And I cannot think of his last name. I'm going to try to Google it real quick. But it's about racialized trauma. And I think every single clinician needs to read this book. Um, It's mind-blowing for me. And um, it really takes a... um, uh, like a somatic approach, like a mind body approach to uh, healing trauma and uh, kind of moving through that. So I love it. He studies the work of um, Bessel van der Kolk, which is the body yeah. keeps the score. He studies a lot about somatic experiencing, uh, Stephen Porges with polyvagal theory. So he integrates all of this and applies it to racialized trauma. And I think it's just an amazing book that every clinician should read my grandmother's hands. And if I could find the, I, I just, Google my grandmother's hands, you'll find it. Yeah. I just looked it up. My grandmother's hands and the author is Resma with two A's at the end. Menachem. M-E-N-A-K-E-M. Yes. Phenomenal book. You know, so now we're talking about um, generational trauma and, and, um, and cultural trauma. Uh, it, it starts to sound a little bit like 
a lot of things can bring trauma. So uh, for me, I was bullied from third grade through 12th, right? And that's not something you would normally suspect of a six foot, one inch, 200 pound man. You know, maybe the reason I am 200 pounds is because I was (laughs) bullied and I went to the gym a lot. Um, But we talked about power differentials too, you know, with um, just because you may be the same race, uh, power differential certainly plays Mm -hmm. into, you know, principal to student and people who don't, uh, don't, handle their their power well you know so to speak and without sounding like we need to all fear for everything because 